What's up guys, it's Dalmatter here, and today we're going to be reacting to a new channel. So this one is The Chieftain. Uh, I believe this guy does military history, specifically about tanks and stuff. People, I've been watching a lot of Laser Pig videos, people suggested that I should check this guy out because he does some good videos. And this one is Inside the Chieftain's Hatch Snapshot, the M1 Thunderbolt. So uh, I believe this is a variation of the M1 Abrams. And uh, yeah, not much else to say about that, but... Uh, link to the original video down below and let's jump into it. So there are a number of vehicles here at Fort Lee which are interesting but not deserving necessarily of a full inside hatch video either because they are just not in a suitable condition inside uh, or because there's only one or two interesting little things to note. So I have decided I'm going to, I'm going to restart the old snapshot series so don't expect a full tour of the vehicle but you are going to see some interesting things that you won't see anywhere else. And I'm starting with Thunderbolt. And Is this guy from the UK? The, the old promo He's got like a slight UK accent, but like a slight American accent. I can't tell where he's from. Pictures or even the Tamiya M1 kit had decals for this particular... This is actually the original Thunderbolt that, that, that rolled out all those many years ago. And what it is, it is the first of the low-rate initial production M1. So technically, I guess it's not really an XM1 at all. There are a couple of older ones out there. But uh, this is unique because, well, it's the first of the production ones. And it's we know it is the vehicle as it appeared way back on a display back then. So I'm going to go around it really quick and show you some of the features of the really, really old M1s uh, that may or may not surprise people who are more familiar with the M1 of today. And I'm going to start off obviously with the 105. Well, that's not particularly new. Neither is the front slope, the driver's position, the headlights uh, with the removable front to change from infrared to daylight. Uh, Coax and gas are in the same place. Uh, fuel tanks are in the same place. What is not in the same place, well, we'll have a look up top, is uh, the CITV position. I'm now going to show an inset of the uh, track tensioning system. It's the old type of uh, piston where you had to loosen a locking nut in. Uh, put some grease in and then tighten the locking nut again. <laughs> it's like it needs an greased extra again. Step needs an extra tool. The current version of the tensioning piston doesn't require it. But otherwise, it is typical M1. So you have a, uh, a bolt here to remove. You've got this safety pin here. And then what you can do is use a, a tanker bar, a pry bar, insert in here. You can open it up and access the rest of the suspension. Of course, you only want to open up one of these. Uh, one of these at a time because they are armored and they're a little bit heavy. At least the first few are. So as you come around to the back, well, we've got a couple of uh, points to note here. Firstly, you'll see that the stowage rack are just these three rails that stop short of the tail of the turret. There is no bustle rack at all. This was a feature of a lot of the early M1s. Uh, if I recall, the bustle didn't show up until the IPs. There is also no turret stowage bin. So, the, the, when is he saying storage? <clears throat> Again, he's got like a little bit of an accent. Um, yeah, what would they store on the side of this? Like anything, I feel like it would get shot at. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I've never driven a tank before, obviously. We're driving around. There's all sorts of little fiddly things that you need to have a, an actual stowage bin as opposed to just rails that you can tie things to. And not everything is going to fit in the Sponson stowage. So hopefully it didn't take too long for those to show up. On the very far rear, well, this is another early good idea that didn't actually work in practice. You'll see that this vehicle has the track retaining ring. And the thinking behind it, it was nice of them to at least think of the problem is that on occasion, a track will walk off. In fact, it's the most common form of losing track as opposed to a break. And it's a sort of a gradual event. It, it doesn't just immediately pop off in the vast majority of cases. And indeed, if you're a switched on crew, you will get a, an indicator that the track is about to walk off. You'll, you hear a sort of a popping sound, a thudding, 
and that's your that's your like three second warning hit the brake immediately if you have a problem you can get out investigate maybe walk it back on without having to brake and rejoin the track no yeah so i can the hear it there behind the track retaining ring is that the track can't actually gradually walk off because this big you know half inch of metal actually it's more than a half inch is three quarter inch maybe is keeping the track in place fine in theory the problem the track didn't care so it turns out that the force of the track moving outwards is stronger than the force of mm. the the tapered metal trying to fight yeah i guess you'd be kind of screwed there either way right because either the force is too strong it's just going to pop the metal off anyway or it's not strong enough it's just going to rub against that and then slowly wear down the track although i guess you know, it, it would wear it down slow enough, hopefully, that it wouldn't be an issue. The other thing I would imagine would be a big issue is that thing getting clogged up, although I'm not sure how much of an issue that would be with the track, like with how powerful they are. They could probably just rip through anything that would clog in there. Right, and push it back in. So eventually the track will come off. It may bend the retaining ring, which, of course, as it's going around, is now going to catch the number seven skirt and rip that off and make a god awful mess. So what you will see happen a lot in the early mid 80s is either the number seven skirt was just removed and tanks would go around with the with the front six and you'll see the sprocket wheel in the back probably with the retaining ring still option number two they took the retaining ring off and they kept the number seven skirt option number three and this was kind of the way they went eventually in the end anyways you will see these number sevens just get cut they uh, they simply cut away a gouge, and part of the thinking for that was not only does it release the probability of getting things getting caught as you go around, uh, but also it allowed better removal of mud that got uh, thrown up, and it could then get discarded out the uh, out the tracks. In fact, now we're looking at little mud shoots in the sprocket. Yep, there are mud shoots in the sprocket. As for the top of the vehicle, a couple of items. Firstly, we have the as we know it, Commander's Weapon Station. If you look at some- I want this. Little fucking military golf cart. That's dope. The pre-production vehicles, there's one still in Fort Hood, there's one in Fort Benning. You'll see that the mount for the caliber 50 is substantially different. And uh, it had a, a sort of a longitudinal feed for the ammunition, which then turned right. In fact, I believe it was still the M85 machine gun at the time before they went to the M2. This vehicle seems to be fitted for, but not with, a crosswind sensor, because that is not a crosswind sensor. Uh, it's either a replica made up after the fact, or they were just in such a hurry to get it out the door that they couldn't wait to get a real one. And, well, there is precedent for that. The blower panels, they seem a little bit thin. It's almost, I, I wonder, are they real blower panels or not? Uh, but uh, certainly I'll, I'll have to have a look at an old photo for that. And you'll see that on an M1A1, for example, you are going to have a round patch uh, for a proposed CITV as per the M1A2. Of course, the M1A1 never did receive it. All we have here are the full bolts that are used uh, for lifting the turret off of the vehicle. So you know, there's the bolts, you know, there is a special hook that gets bolted in and with uh, them front and back and then there's a notch or another couple of uh, mounts at the back, you're able to sling up the, uh, the turret. Of course, what in reality will happen is people will place spare road wheels here. This is bad, don't do it, uh, unless you have one of the new bolts that was specially designed for putting road wheels on that position because what was happening was everybody was doing it was messing up the bolts which meant that they had difficulty in removing the turrets off of vehicles for maintenance and eventually somebody in the army had the good idea and said you know let's uh, let's give them a bolt that they can actually put road wheels on the top of so there we go I'm not gonna go inside just gonna put a put inset because as you can see when they oh, uh, she's seen when better they days. turned this thing into a monument, they pulled out the guts of the vehicle. So um, it looks a lot roomier than it actually is. You can see the turret basket is still there, the platform. Uh, you can see how little space the 105 takes inside this turret, 
which was originally, of course, designed from the outset to be capable of being upgraded to the 120. And compared to the, uh, compared to the <laughs> 120, the 105 takes up no space whatsoever. All right, well, that is it, <coughs> a snapshot of a Thunderbolt. Just uh, a couple of neat features from the early vehicle. Talk to you on the next one. Yeah, that was really interesting. So what the M1 Thunderbolt, is that a specific variant of the M1 Abrams then? Um, let's see. I can't really find uh, everything. I, I Google M1 Thunderbolt. It's all about like the fucking Thunderbolt adapter for the Mac. Um, what if I type in M1 A Abrams Thunderbolt? There we go. I'm going to go to Tank Encyclopedia. I'm sure they'll know. Um, what do we got here? Is this variant? Let me Oh wait, is the Thunderbolt just the nickname? Weird. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not entirely sure. Is the Thunderbolt just a nickname for the Abrams or is that a variant of the Abrams? Let me know down below. But uh, yeah, that was an interesting little video. Not much I could add to it. It was just kind of me watching it for the most part, I guess. Was, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you in the next one.